Welcome Valley Baptist Church. Well, I uh, have some good news. We got some equipment for, uh, for us to be able to stream our services from here on out, but we still had some uh, technical difficulties that we needed to figure out. So be watching your flash for this next week because we may be um, videoing from the church facility and have singing and announcements, a scripture reading, and my message. So it'll, it'll feel a little bit more like you're going to church rather than hearing me from my office as you've been for the last now 11 weeks. Um, so we're going to continue our series in the book of Daniel. But before I do that, I want to make a few announcements and then ask you to join me in prayer. Um, uh, again, one of those announcements is be praying that we're able to uh, do the streaming. Again, we're going to attempt to do that this week. Watch for that because what that means is we'll be live and we're either shooting for 10, 1030, but we'll, we'll let you know for sure if that's on. If not, it'll be done like this. And again, the, uh, the best way for you to find that out is uh, you should be subscribed to the Valley Flash, and that way uh, all you got to do is click where it tells you to click, and you'll be able to, to figure it out pretty easily. Um, another thing that uh, I'd ask you to be praying for is we put a search team together with some of the elders and deacons and some lay people from the church. Uh, we've already, we're already in the process of finding a family pastor. Uh, we already hired Kyle, who many of you watched the video of last week, and so he'll remain with us, uh, working primarily with the high school and junior hires. And then we're in the process of finding a full-time family pastor that will really uh, hone in on family ministries and children's ministries and the oversight of our youth ministry. So uh, we're, we're going to have our first interviews this week, so be praying for uh, wisdom for us as we look for that as a church. Also, just want to thank all of you who've continued to give faithfully, even though we haven't been meeting, you've been sending in your checks, you've, uh, the easiest way to do that is just to have automatic uh, out of your bank account, and that's the way I do it, and, and many of you do that, about 30% of our giving comes from that, I think. Uh, but that's just an easy way to have that automatically done every month. We are a little below budget. And uh, we're, try we're trying to do everything we can to be frugal. Uh, but again, we have ongoing regular expenses that there's just no way out of. Um, so I, I thank you, those of you who can give, please continue to give. And thank you, especially those of you who are giving sacrificially uh, during a difficult time. Another thing um, is I just want to thank those of you who've, for the last two weeks, been participating in our Zoom life groups. Um, there's four of those going, uh, Monday nights with Mike Much at 6, uh, Thursday evenings with uh, Jim Young, I think, I can't remember which is at 6 and which is at 6.30, but if you look at our website, you'll find out, but Larry Ekdahl is doing a group, and Jim Young's doing a group, and then I'm doing a day group, uh, which we have plenty of room for, there's only a few of us in there, uh, so if you're still not in a Zoom life group, gives you the opportunity to be able to uh, see each other on video and talk and encourage one another and pray for one another, which we all need, uh, especially during these difficult times right now. Um, last thing, uh, many of you are in tune with what's going on with the riots all over our country and in different parts of the world due to uh, the George Floyd incident. And we just want to pray that Again, just as God would use the difficulty with coronavirus, that this would be a wake-up call uh, for for the. I mean, what people need is they need Jesus. They they need the humility of knowing that God is God loves all people all over the world. Doesn't matter what color, doesn't matter what ethnicity you have. And as a church, I'm grateful that we represent. Uh, so many different ethnic groups and, and colors and uh, economic, uh, you know, levels and so forth. And again, we're, the thing that unites us is Jesus Christ. And so let's just pray that God would use these times. He would use us 
in these times, just like he did Daniel and his friends in our Babylon, that we would be able to make a difference in our culture here in Marin and beyond for the glory of God. And uh, I just want to thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to sharing Daniel chapter 2, the first part of Daniel chapter 2 together. Um, so let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for each person who's listening. I thank you for Valley Baptist Church and the, the faithfulness of those who, who are listening to these messages and seeking to apply your word in their lives. Lord, help us to love, um, to love and pray for our enemies. Help us when it's hard for us to love others, um, that you would give us your love. It, it's, so di it's so easy to love those who love you back. Very difficult to love those who hate you or wish you ill or betray you. And, but Lord, with your help, you give us the ability, the supernatural ability to love all kinds of people. And so Lord, I pray that Valley Baptist would always be a church where everyone is loved and accepted, no matter what, where they're coming from, no matter what their background is. And, and yet at the same time that we would never compromise the truth that what you call sin will always be sin. And we love, we want to love those who just like ourselves struggle with sin and are trying their best uh, to live out their calling as saints to your glory. Lord, I pray for the, um, I pray for the police. I pray for those with so much anger out of what's happened. Lord, the only solution to this is the gospel. And so I, I pray for all Christians that we would uh, make a difference, that we would influence people with our own love for others that are different than us, and that we're able to share the good news of how we can be forgiven, even though we're at enmity with you, that you forgive anyone who comes to you and confesses their sin. So, Lord, uh, from all accounts it, uh, that I've read, it looks like George Floyd is with you. He, he professed faith in Christ, and we thank you for that. But there was definitely injustice done, and I pray that that wouldn't birth more injustice, but that we would all evaluate ourselves in light of your holiness and your standards, and that you would bring about the unity in the diversity of our culture through people coming to a knowledge of your truth and why we were made to know you and to make you known. Um, Lord, we, we lift up those who are still have coronavirus or um, and, and that you would protect us from getting coronavirus. We pray that you would eradicate uh, COVID-19. And we ask that you would give us wisdom to know how to live in these trying times. May your word guide us, may your word direct us, may you grant us wisdom to be able to carry out uh, our calling as your ambassadors in a culture where we are aliens and strangers in this land. But may you get glory when, the, when, when people see our good deeds and feel and sense our love. And God, we want to be used and be faithful for you until Jesus returns or you take us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's go ahead and dive into Daniel chapter 2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide uh, Daniel chapter 2 in, into this week and next week. And I'm going to look at verses 23 today. So before we dive in, I just, just a few, uh, what do I want to say, words by way of introduction to set up the context so last, our last time together, uh, our last two times, we, we finished chapter one and we, we looked at the fact that Daniel and his friends had been taken captive from Judah to Babylon in 605 BC. And where we pick it up in chapter two, Daniel and his friends has, have already been trained in Babylonian history, culture, the arts, economics, physics, I mean, you name it, they've been trained in it now, well-educated uh, in order to serve the king. And uh, their three years of training now are up, and now they're about to be given their specific positions uh, in, in a high place in Babylon under the authority of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so that's where we pick it up here. And 
There's two different passages that we don't have time to go into at length, but I think that set up the context as well. One is Joseph and his dreams in Genesis 41. And Joseph, if you remember in Genesis, in the story of Genesis, uh, it, it's interesting because Joseph and Daniel are two characters in the Bible that really stand out because, uh, honestly, you can make a case that there's, there's no talking about or no descriptions of evil in their lives. What we see is two men that were faithful to God, loved God, and were put in high positions, both of them at the prime minister level, Joseph in Egypt and Daniel in Babylon. Uh, when Egypt was the greatest nation and when Babylon was the greatest nation, that they both served under pagan rulers, and yet God used them to uh, carry out his common grace among pagans as well as his followers, and use them uh, to do great good for all people and especially to point others to the gospel that was to come, the Messiah that was to come, Jesus, and that by putting our faith and trust in him, we can have salvation by grace through faith alone in Jesus. So um, so th that's one aspect is dreams. And dreams, it's important that you understand, were very big in the Middle East back then. They still are. As a matter of fact, I've recommended to many of you that the greatest autobiography I've read in recent years, and I can't think of a better one, is Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nabil Qureshi, who came out of uh, being a Muslim, uh, came out of a devout worshiper of um, Allah, and took a four-year process of uh, evaluating both Christian truth claims as well as the claims of Islam and comparing them and through that, he ended up becoming uh, a Christian. And now he had cancer a few years ago. He's with the Lord, but he continues. We can watch his videos. We can read his books. And I highly recommend Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. If you're wondering what to do during this time, great book. Many of you have already bought the book and read it, and you've told me it's one of the best books you've ever read. So uh, I highly recommend that to you. But one of the things that we see in that book is that Nabil Qureshi and many Muslims around the world, uh, that God has spoken to them through dreams, just like he spoke to Nebuchadnezzar and he spoke to Pharaoh and then gave Joseph the ability to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and gave Daniel, we're going to see, uh, the ability to also interpret the dreams of a pagan king. God oftentimes will speak to non-believers through dreams. And when I was in India in 1999, I had the experience of both seeing this in action where pagans had dreamed dreams related to Jesus. And when we came to them and told them about Jesus, they said, we dreamed about this. And I, again, I had the privilege of experiencing revival. I hope I get to experience it again here in Marin County. But when I was in India, in one day, I, I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with 40 people. And 39 of those repented of their sins and put their trust in Christ in, one, in, a, in just a few hours. And I got to baptize those people. More people than I probably baptized in America in my lifetime. I got to baptize in one day in India. But one of the things that stood out to me is how many Christians had visions in India when I was there and how many pagans had dreams of Christ. And so that's what we see in the book of Genesis and in the book of Daniel, and we still see it today, that God oftentimes will reveal himself to pagans in dreams when they're sleeping at night, and he will reveal truth to them, and then at some point he will send missionaries to hear uh, and confirm what they've dreamed about that this is true, that this is real. So this is something that went on in biblical times. It's something that still goes on today. But what's interesting also is in the Old and New Testaments, you'll find that followers of, of uh, Jews in the Old Testament who were looking forward to the Messiah, put their faith in Jesus, had many visions of Jesus. 
And we see that, for instance, in Isaiah 6, the famous vision that Isaiah has of Jesus, according to who the book of John, that that's a vision of the one who rules, the one who reigns, the only God. So, um, so it's important that you understand that even though if even though if God has not spoken to you in a dream or a vision, and I've never had that happen to me, we primarily uh, get what we know about God, and God communicates to us through the Bible, and we even see that in Hebrews chapter one that in the last days or in the first days God spoke through His prophets. Uh, and, and he talks about rev, through revelation, through dreams, through visions. But in these last days, he's spoken to us through Jesus. So we have the whole Old Testament, the whole New Testament, where God, where we can go anytime and read about and listen to what God is saying to us and how to apply it. And we need to take advantage of that. And that's why we're always going through a book of the Old Testament or a book of the New Testament, the whole counsel of God how it all fits together, and how it relates to our lives. Uh, so anyway, so when we start chapter 2, which we're going to in just a second, it's important that you understand the importance of dreams in the way God speaks to pagans. And so that's one aspect of the context that's very important for you to get. A second thing that's very important for you to understand in relationship to the context is Isaiah chapters 40 to 66 because Daniel would have known Isaiah for the whole book of Isaiah and so it was a history of what God has done for his people Israel but also a ton of prophecy of what was to come and just like last week we saw that Daniel and his friends were able to remain firm and remain faithful in a alien culture foreigners in that land and remain firm in their creed and their convictions and be used in that culture for the glory of God uh, based on what they knew of the scriptures. And we'll perhaps remind you of a, a little bit of that in a few minutes. Oh, I need, I need to take a drink. <laughs> so, what we have in, in Isaiah 40 to 66 that Isaiah would have known as well, is he's in a very pluralistic, idolatrous culture. And Nebuchadnezzar and any king in Babylon would also see himself as a god. And we're going to see that in a few chapters, in chapter 4. Uh, so, so there's a plurality of gods where even Nebuchadnezzar uh, thinks he's a god. But they're gods for different things. And what Daniel would have known, according to Isaiah chapter 40 through 66, is, is that there's only one God, that God is great, that God knows all things, that God's all-powerful. In other words, everything we know about the nature, the character, the attributes of God, we see in Isaiah chapter 40 to 66. And it's specifically in comparison with the idols of the time, the idols of the day. So here Daniel is about to serve a, 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 a king who thinks he's a god, little g, and um, in, in, in a very pressure-induced situation, which we're going to see as well. And so you and I oftentimes now and in the future are going to find ourselves in pressure-filled situations where our job's on the line, our marriage is on the line. Our relationship with our children is on the line. And it's over issues of, of idolatry, truth, and the application of those things. And unless you're really grounded in good, solid theology that takes your roots deep so that when the winds, the storms, the trials blow through your life, you don't fall over, you don't topple. Uh, down, but you're able to remain firm in the truth. And that's what we're going to see with Daniel. And we're also going to see that Nebuchadnezzar is a stereotypical reactor. This is what we see going on in our country right now. Because of injustice, people are overreacting to the situation. And that's what you do in the flesh. That's what you do when you think 
uh, things are out of your control or that you're trying to control things. That's what you do when you don't know that God is sovereign over everything and he's working out all things for your good and his glory. You take matters into your own hands and when you take matters into your own hands in the flesh and not for the glory of God, it results in catastrophe. So I don't want you, I don't want your life to result in catastrophe and I don't want my life to result in catastrophe. So again, what we're going to learn from Daniel is so relevant to whatever you're going through and whatever I'm going through today. We are under pressure. We're always going to be under pressure and have challenges from the enemy to fall into sin, but from God to overcome sin and overcome the challenges that come our way. So how do we do that? Well, let's dive in to the passage. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, it begins in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and I need to stop again. The second year of Nebuchadnezzar. It's important that you understand that in Babylonian uh, culture, because critics of Daniel, as a matter of fact, the book of Daniel has been the most, uh, the book of the Bible that has been attacked more by liberal scholarship, by critical scholars than any other book. And the reason is, and I, I hold to an early dating of Daniel, that it was written in 600, uh, 600 to 530 BC, somewhere in there. Critical scholars, liberal scholars say that it was written between 200 and 100 BC. And the reason they do that is because they don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in the prophetic. They, they don't believe that there's any way that Daniel could have known the future and been that accurate about writing about it. And again, that's one of the reasons why, one of the reasons I'm a Christian, I, the only reason I'm a Christian is because I believe Christianity is true. And one of the things that, that, that are high on the list of reasons for why I believe Christianity is true is because of the prophecy that has already been fulfilled. Uh, it was written and then it happened in the future. And Daniel is one of the key books in the Bible that shows this to be true. And critics and liberal scholars just can't buy that because of their naturalistic worldview. They say there's no way that Daniel could have known this. So everything in the book of Daniel, the critics will attack. And this is one of those areas. They say, ah, there's a contradiction here. This wasn't the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. This was the third year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. But what they're doing is they're basing it on, on the Hebrew standard of chronology rather than the Babylonian standard of chronology. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just want to point it out in case somebody objects to the early date of Daniel to you, that uh, the, uh, the quick way to explain this is, is like this, is that in the years of Daniel's training, the first year of Daniel's training was the first year of the, uh, the what's called the accession to the throne of Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, you have the first year of Daniel's training, the second year, and the third year, and that's where we pick it up here. But for Nebuchadnezzar, it's his second year uh, as king in the sense that the first year is considered accession, and then, the and then he has the second year and then the third year. And so he's having his dream in Daniel's third year and in Nebuchadnezzar's second year as king. Uh, a, an easy way to, to get this is in America, we go to school before college for 13 years. But if you start in first grade to 12th grade, that's 12 years. So kindergarten doesn't count as a year. It's the accession year, so to speak. So that's how you reconcile these differences. It's actually very simple, but liberals and critical scholars make a big deal about this. And that's why any time that a criti uh, somebody criticizes the Bible or somebody says the Bible's full of contradictions, where there's always a, a, a pretty good answer uh, for these kinds of things, and, and this would be one of those. Okay, so... If you didn't get all that, play it back, uh, and, or you could ask me or email me and I can explain it if I didn't explain it that well there. Okay, so in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. So here he's, he's got these dreams, it's, it appears to be the same dream over and over again, and 
because of that, he can't sleep at night. These dreams are so real, and he believes that uh, the gods are communicating to him about the future of his reign and the empire of Babylon. So he's very troubled by this. So verse 2, Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So these are all, this is his cabinet. These are the highest level um, counselors that he has in his kingdom. And he wants them to come and tell him his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. The Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, and by the way, this verse 4 begins the Aramaic sec section of the book of Daniel. So from Daniel 2, 4, B, until the end of chapter 7, verse 28, it's all Aramaic here. And that's important for you to understand because the first chapter is in Hebrew, chapters 8 through 12 are in Hebrew, and now what we have is we have the beginning of what's called the times of the Gentiles. You may want to write this verse down, Luke 21 to 24. Jesus talked about this, and he said, this is Jesus quoting, uh, this is Luke 21, 24. Jesus saying about the times of the Gentiles, which is in, in Aramaic, it's the common language of the Babylonians and the language of commerce, the language of education, much like English would be today around the world. Uh, Jesus said this, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So this is what, what takes place now from 2-4 to the end of chapter 7 is... It's history and prophecy concerning the fact that because God's people, Israel, have failed to hold to the Sabbath, failed to hold to the worship of him, and, and have put their trust in idols, there are, their plan is basically put on hold for now. Not just now, but until Jesus returns to establish the millennial kingdom in the future. And we're going to talk a lot about that in the book of Revelation that we're going to study next. But what we're in right now is called the times of the Gentiles. So that the gospel is primarily saving Gentiles around the world. Because, and, and the Gentiles are the ones that are primarily proclaiming that. It doesn't mean that God's forgotten Israel. God will fulfill his promises to Israel, as we saw last week when we looked at what Daniel and his friends would have known about the future from the covenant that God made with them, as well as the prophecies of the future. And we're going to look more into that as time comes. But what this means is because uh, his people blew it and they forfeited their calling, he opened it up to the Gentiles. And so what we have in the world right now is we primarily have many Gentiles coming to faith around the world, uh, such that Christianity to this day is the largest religion, even though I don't believe it's a, rel a religion, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can't work for our salvation. He worked perfectly to attain our salvation, and he gives us salvation by grace alone through faith in him. So it's a relationship with God. However, if you look at that, there are more Christians than anything else, and then the second largest uh, religion would be Islam. Uh, but again, there's uh, most of those... Christians are Gentiles, uh, and, but God has a special plan for Israel and for ethnic Israel and those that he's chosen, and we're going to see a great revival of Jews coming to faith during the tribulation and uh, in the millennium. So, now we're in the time of the Gentiles, and it changes from Hebrew, the language of God's chosen people, to Aramaic, the language of the common people, the language of the Gentiles, so that the gospel would go forth to them. Again, the proclamation that all of the sacrificial system points to Jesus, the Messiah. So we're in the times of the Gentiles now, until Jesus returns. And it's just important for you to understand that, that this is what's going on, and it's uh, brilliant of God to put the language into our Aramaic so that the message 
to the Gentiles and to the Jews would go forth in the common, common language of all peoples uh, at the time. All right, verse 4. O king, they say in Aramaic, uh, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. And they're basically blowing smoke here. But it's interesting that they want Nebuchadnezzar to tell them the dream. And I think Nebuchadnezzar has been disenchanted with them for a while, so he's not going to tell them the dream. He wants them to tell him what he dreamed, because he knows uh, they, they don't know what they're talking about. And I think he wants to put them to the test here. So it's interesting. Uh, verse 5, The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar, tell us what you really think. <laughs> I mean, this guy was a tough dude. Um, you know, if you don't tell me what I dreamed and the interpretation of it, I'm going to kill you. And it's going to be a brutal killing, tearing you limb from limb. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was not a nice guy. And so what we see with Nebuchadnezzar is we see a, a, a man that is prideful, that is in the flesh, and gets whatever he wants, and he's the king. And there's no House of Representatives, there's no Senate to keep him in check. What he says goes. And so you could only imagine the terror of his inner circle here um, with this whole scenario. Verse 6, But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So the bad news, if you don't know the dream and tell it to me, you're toast. Good news, you know it and tell it to me, you're going to be rewarded greatly. Uh, then verse 7, then they answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream. They're trying to slip that in. Tell us the dream and we will show its interpretation. And then the king answered and said, I know with certainty what you're tr that you're just trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you, death. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. And the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. No one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and furious, very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion. I mean, notice Daniel being calm, cool, and collected. He, he, his first thing is not to react. Because that would be many of our first response. If we can't interpret the dream, if we don't know what the dream is and interpret it, king's going to kill you. Talk about pressure. And... That means all the wise men, including Daniel and his friends, are going to be torn limb from limb and killed if they don't know the dream and give the interpretation to him. But notice Daniel. He's prudent, and prudence is, is a term uh, synonymous with wisdom, that you have knowledge and you know how to apply that knowledge. And Daniel just comes across, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar's this hothead, kill them off with their heads. Daniel comes into the situation with prudence and discretion. And again, what we see is God giving Daniel favor because of Daniel's faithfulness. Because of Daniel's love for God and his faithfulness to God, his obedience to God, what God does is he blesses him time and time again with open doors to be able to make a difference in culture. And God will do the same thing with you and with me. When we find ourselves under pressure, don't cave, don't buy the lies, don't buy the idolatries, Look to God, look to his truth, ask for favor with him, and he will use you.
to make a difference in our culture. So that's what we see with Daniel here. And so he goes to Arioch, verse 14, the captain of the king's guard who'd gone out to kill the wise men of Arioch. So uh, this guy, Arioch, is a hitman. And that's who uh, Daniel has to deal with, is this guy who's come out to kill him. And verse 15, this is what Daniel declares to Arioch, the king's captain. Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and he requested the king to appoint him a time that he might, excuse me, he might show the interpretation to the king. So Daniel's calm, cool, and collected. And the reason Daniel can be calm, cool, and collected under pressure is because he has a relationship with his covenant God. He knows God's promises. He knows his history with Israel. He knows the truth. Uh, and he, he holds on to that with every fiber of his being, no matter what the circumstances are. And that's why Daniel uh, remained faithful. That's why Daniel was used mightily. And you and I have that same opportunity in our culture today. So let's pick it up at verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And it's interesting that Daniel's using their God-given names instead of their Babylonian names, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might or power. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O oh God, my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's matter, the king's dream. So what I want to close with real quickly is just three things to do when you and I are under pressure and they're in the last few verses uh, that we just looked at, verses 19 to 23. Next week, we're going to look at the actual dream and its interpretation and the significance both in history and in prophecy. And you're going to uh, just see uh, the incredible supernatural element here that uh, Daniel didn't have the ability to do this, but that God gave him the abil ability. And that's important in and of itself, that you remember that whatever you're going through, God knows that you're going through it, and you need to come to him. And so there's three things that Daniel does. Instead of reacting, instead of being all freaked out about the fact that the king's going to kill these guys, he goes first to God. Why? Because he knows his God. He knows truth about God. He knows truths about God. And he holds on to those, and he believes those with all his might, with all of his love, with all of his strength, with all of his heart. Daniel is a man who goes hard after God, no matter what's going on around him. And that's so important that the number one relationship that you and I go hard after in our lives is with the one who never changes, the one who's always holy, 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 righteous, perfect, wise, merciful, gracious, loving, and on and on. And Daniel goes first and foremost to his friends. He goes first and foremost to his friends. And so we see three things that he does under pressure. The first thing he does is he seeks the wisdom of his friends. Now, these are mature, godly men. And so that's why we have the church. We have the church, and typically in a church, you want your leaders, your deacons, your elders... The elders are also the pastors. These are your wisest uh, people in the church. 
And so Daniel has this little remnant that's been taken away from Israel that he continues to pray with. He continues to do Bible studies with. He continues, they encourage each other and they glean from each other's wisdom. And that's where Daniel goes first. But he goes to be with them. If he didn't have them, he would have gone to God first. But he went to them so that they all together could seek the wisdom and the mercy of God. And that's the second thing. So the first thing you do under pressure is you seek God's wisdom among men or women who are wise and mature in the Lord. We see that in verse 14 and 17 of chapter 2. And then the second thing is they pray for God's mercy and for his understanding. God, I don't know this dream. I don't, how could I interpret the dream if I don't even know what the dream is? And so he, he goes to God in faith that God will be merciful to him and he will grant him the ability to know the dream and to interpret the dream. And when he gets the dream, when God reveals the dream, and, he, and how he reveals it to him isn't in a, in a dream, it's in a vision. So Daniel gets to see the vision of God's dream. We're going to look at that next week. He tells Nebuchadnezzar and the court, his, the other so-called wise men who weren't very wise, he tells all of them, I can't do this. Where, where my ability to, uh, to know what the dream is and to interpret its dream come from Yahweh, from the relationship that I have with this personal God, idols can't do anything because idols are nothing. They're a fig newton of your imagination uh but my god knows all he's all knowing and he's all wise and he's the one who's revealed this dream to me and we're going to see what the dream is next week but he prays for god's mercy and his understanding and god is both merciful and under and gives him the understanding of the dream and the interpretation of the dream and then thirdly under pressure what he does is after he prays, the very first thing he does is he blesses God and he praises him. And he recites approximately seven different attributes of God, which we see, which he would have known from Isaiah chapter 40 to 66. So what do you and I need to do when we're under pressure? I know you're under pressure and I know I'm under pressure. We do these three things. Uh, we do these three things, and they're all based on what we previously knew about Daniel and his friends in chapter 1. Here, was godly, uh, here were godly young men, teenagers, who knew their creed. We looked at this last week. They knew the covenant of God. They knew his commandments. They knew that God is just. They knew the history of the chosen people. They knew their future, and they realized that all of this would serve them well in a pagan culture. Uh, they also had major convictions based on their creed that God sovereignly is just and he's merciful, that God gives wisdom uh, to kings and leaders of nations and to individuals like Daniel and his friends. And then we saw that God's greatest gift of all, he gave three times in chapter one, but the greatest gift of all is in his son, Jesus Christ. And so, what's your creed? What are your convictions? What are you doing in culture? And how does that reflect your relationship with God? And the only way that that can reflect your relationship with God is you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In Proverbs, Proverbs, the whole book of Proverbs is about wisdom. And essentially what, what Proverbs is, is it's an encyclopedia of what the only perfect wise man who ever lived, who that is and who that was and what he's like. And, it, and Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, points to Jesus. 31 chapters in Proverbs, I don't think that's by accident, 31 days in a month. I've heard from many biblical scholars and missionaries and godly Christians of all stripes, men and women, that have said, what kept them faithful, how they remain faithful, is they read a proverb a day. And what the Proverbs do is they point you to who the book of Daniel points you to. The only man who was ever faithful 100% of the time. And you and I need to keep our eyes on Jesus. The one who's the author and the perfecter and the finisher 
of our faith. If we remain faithful with our creed and con convinced and have convictions based on what we believe, God will use us in our culture under pressure and the pressure that you're in right now, the pressure that I'm in right now, what we need to do is exactly what Daniel did. So would you close in prayer with me and ask God to give us understanding, to be merciful to us, to give us the wisdom we need with the pressures that we're under, to remain faithful and true to the author and the finisher of our faith, our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you can do it right now. All you need to do is just confess your sin and repent of that. Turn from that. Turn from your idols. Turn from the things you've been worshiping or putting before Jesus. Say, Jesus, I want to be like Daniel. I want to be like John the Baptist. I want to be like other Christians I know that I see under pressure putting you first. I, I want to be that. So would you join me as we close in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for each person who's listening right now. And Lord, some of those listening are under tremendous pressure. But again, when we go to Daniel, it's such a breath of fresh air because I doubt that very many of us are under the pressure of literal death from a king. And yet Daniel, under that pressure, was able to be calm and cool and collected. And he was able to respond and not react. And he was able to gather together with other believers and share collective wisdom and pursue you for mercy and understanding. And God, you helped Daniel. You gave him exactly what he needed. And then we're going to see next week that you raised him up to the second highest position in all of Babylon because he was faithful to you. And he pursued you. And he knew what he believed. And he was convicted of the truth and you used him in Babylon. And God, we want to be used by you as well today in our modern day Babylon in which we live. May we be faithful to you, the one who is always faithful to us. And Lord, if I pray, if there's, I pray that if there's anyone listening right now who doesn't know you personally, God, thank you that you revealed yourself to me many years ago and that all I knew to do was confess my sins. And your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you cleanse those who are listening right now who confess their sins of all their unrighteousness? And would you, in place of their sins, replace that with the righteousness of Christ? the one who's all wise, the one who's perfect, the one who came to die on the cross for our sins individually. And you loved us so much that you made provision for us to be right, to be reconciled with you by faith in Jesus. So I pray that those who've confessed their sins would put their faith, their trust, their creed in Christ and him alone for their salvation and that you would save them. Lord, Help us. We don't know how much time we have before Jesus returns. I believe it's sin. And if that's today, that would be wonderful. But it may not be for a few years. So help us to remain faithful under the pressure we find ourselves in. To capitulate to a culture that hates you. To a culture that doesn't want your authority over them. To a culture that thinks they know so much and yet it's their pride and their religiosity and their rebellion that keeps them from your love for them. And so, Lord, may we be the ones who share with them your love and your truth so that they would know you and you would get the glory. And we praise you. We bless you. We thank you for your sovereignty. We thank you for your goodness. And we just ask that today you would elevate us high over the pressures we face and that we would see your hand and your mercy and get your understanding and get your wisdom to be able to accomplish what you've called us to be and do through Christ our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit and for 
your glory. Amen.